<laughs> well, that's uh, Vincent Fez, of course, and um, amazing, amazing music by Michael Mann. Um, but also features probably the preeminent member of Franco's repertoire, uh, the scene. Um, you can count the number of Franco films where you don't see the sea or the coast on, you know, sort of like a hand, one and a half hands, probably. Um, and even then, you've got, uh, you know, the river Seine in uh, Exorcism uh, by the side of um, where the action is set. Um, so the sea is a constant presence. It doesn't have to be, of course. I mean, of course, Spain's got very lovely coastlines, but I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't shoot on the land as well. But Franco very definitely chose to go to the coast over and over and over again. I'm just going to read a quote now um, that's quite interesting. I'll tell you who it is afterwards. Um, it's a completely spontaneous film. I've never been so worried as I was two days before shooting began. I had nothing, nothing at all. Oh, well, I had the book and a certain number of locations. I knew it would take place by the sea. So is that just Franco working on Counters Perverse? No, it's uh, Jean Goddard speaking about the shooting of Pierre de Fou. Um, now, how many Franco films must have begun with exactly this meager tally of preparations? Um, I mean, Jess notoriously began filming with scripts that consisted of just a few pages, uh, general instructions, and a vague connection to maybe one of the Marquis de Sade's books. Um, and the sea. Yeah, the sea always, constant presence. The sea is the most regular actor in Franco's repertory cast. It's a foreground element in over half of the films and a background element in most of the others. Sex and death by the sea pretty much covers it. Um, and that's about three quarters of his career quite easily. Now, more precisely, it's the coast that obsesses him. He uses it to mark an arrival in 99 Women, say, or version of the Living Dead, and Sands and Silencio de Tumbo, um, Abrafion, Sexual de Una, Mujer, <coughs> Casada. Uh, in all, all of those films, you see significant characters at the start of their filming journey uh, arriving uh, on the coastline in a way that carries with it a strong association of ruthlessness, being far away from home and a stranger in a strange land. More importantly, though, the coastline carries a symbolic charm. It's a boundary, a, a liminal space between two different but interrelated states. On the one hand, solidity, certainty, definition, on the other, fluidity, uncertainty, dissolution. The coastline can be the end or the beginning of something, and it's also both of these things at the same time. The two contrasting states of being comes condensed into a single image. This sense of a threshold between contrasting states, uh, between opposites, gives rise to an elusive otherness, suggesting a portal through which the everyday world can be escaped. Among the films in which beaches and coastlines are used in, a, in this sort of way, uh, are Necronomicon, with Lorna's dream castle located right at the sea's edge. Venus and Furs, which we just saw, obviously, Jimmy's existential confusion and his mystical encounter with death <coughs> at the beach. Vampiros Lesbos, where you have the seaside home of Countess and Nadine, uh, um, a kind of um, an inversion of the Count Dracula situation where the castle of Count Dracula is in the in, you know, landlocked and uh, dark and musty. She's uh, a vampire who's chosen to live by the sea with a beautiful swimming pool and uh, bright sunshine. Um, the erotic classic of Frankenstein, while Cagliostro's palace is um, directed by the sea. So many other films. Um, Les exploits erotique de Machista dans la Atlantida, uh, while the survivors of the lost kingdom of Atlantis are clinging to the rocks of a nearby magical island. Shining Sex again. Um, there's a coastal boat ride in Shining Sex which seems to embody a trip into deepest abstraction. Um, the examples really could pile up. Um, there's, there's a sexual frisson too. Um, these omnipresent shots of beaches and coastlines suggest a hovering at the brink, a desire to remain poised at the turbulent edge of pleasure, rather as one may wish to defer an orgasm and remain forever at its ecstatic order. Based on the viewing of his work, Frank was clearly a man for whom the extended tease is a great deal more interesting than the words. Between sex and desire, doing it and wanting it, the fish on the line and the one that got away, in the space between pleasure and the torment of deferral by nearly all of Franco's strategies of eroticism. And of course, no list of seaside connotations would be complete without acknowledging 
under the beach and wear women take off all their clothes. Franco's films speak of our ceaseless fascination with the coast. Spain's dramatic and beautiful coastline draws visitors in their millions every summer. Why? Most people would say that we head towards the sea when we want to escape. But in a sense, do we also go to the edge because we want to jump off? We want to be swept away by an unexpected wave. There is a darkness to the sea, even when illuminated by the most dazzling Mediterranean sunshine. Our fascination with it cannot entirely be diminished by and domesticated by the triviality of the culture that springs up alongside it. Sticks of rock and ice creams and deck chairs. All of these mundane accoutrements distract us from the real reason we flock to the sea, for the sense of being at the edge. However safely decorated with donkey rides and beach volleyball, the edge gives us pause. The open horizon shows the clutter of our lives to be transient. And as we look to the sea, we feel a heart's lift of freedom from the mundane and the dizzying sense of the eternal. If coastal destinations speak of an atavistic desire to see an end to things, then among the connotations we need to list are darkness and danger, in a word, death. The sea connects with death in Franco's films, and the coast is a place where killers reside. Consider the sex murderers in Eugene the story of their journey into perversion, heavy dirt class A, Lillian the, per the perverted virgin, the death-dealing villain of Lake Vanganza de Butamabuso, glamorous but deadly vengeful friend of Darwin, she had an ecstasy, the destructive patriarch and his vengeful stepdaughter in the Knights of Linda, the rapacious witches in the Lord of the Exorcist and the Homosexual. Death occurs in coastal settings in all of these films, and many more. Even the women in prison films tend to be set beside the coast. The thanatological aspect of this seaside obsession is dramatized in its starkest form in Countess Perverse, and later in the partial remake of the sexual story of O in which despairing man deliberately drowns himself while carrying a dead woman into the sea. Finally, one cannot respond to Franco's obsession with coastlines without thinking about a special sense of time implied by the action of the ceaseless ocean beating against the shore, century after century. Each grain of sand is a rock smashed into dust over eons. Little wonder that we should speak about the sands of time. Beaches are cosmic, elemental, they're images of time. Franco filmed so many of them, so many seas and tides, that the fractal splendor of the material world enters into the grain of this cinema. And isn't it funny that we talk about the grain of the film? <coughs> if you want to play around with the audience's sense of time, then stripping away the transient details of human life and emphasizing the ancient forces of creation is a good way to initiate the process. Subjective distension of the mind prone to sudden shifts in density, moving through clusters of loosely arranged events, and then pulling away from itself as if expanding. This sensation can occur anywhere. It's not the sole province of the best films. It erupts in some of the shonkiest and shoddiest too. What's striking is that it feels self-similar across so many different films. Time dilation is one of the major fingerprints that Franco seems to leave on his work. <coughs> 